at Bonnie Eagle Middle School in Boston. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Netto for her outstanding achievement. We've been celebrating her for days and she's loving it. <laughs> Doesn't it say so <laughs> I'd also like to recognize two of our students, one who we know very well, who sits here with us, um, Dylan Hinton, who is a senior at Scarborough High School, and Sophia Martins, who's also a senior, have earned the, um, have been the SMMA Citizenship Award. And so I'll say a little bit about both of these students so that you can fully appreciate all that they do to contribute to our schools. Um, Sophia's athletic and academic achievement are evidence of her exceptional work ethic, her talent, and dedication. Her compassion for others has been demonstrated through her extensive volunteer service and demonstrated leadership. These qualities have earned her, I lost my track. Um, these qualities have earned her the highest respect by her peers, teammates, teachers, and coaches. Within our school community, she has been an inspirational leader on our student council and in our key club. While her gentle demeanor and desire to help made her a dynamic member of our makes her a dynamic member of our natural helpers program. Sophia also shares her joy of learning and the reading buddies at Wentworth School. In addition to summer employment at a local market, she babysits throughout the school year. Sophia has been a long-term volunteer at the Maine Medical Center and plans to pursue medical studies specializing in pediatrics, cardiology, or sports medicine. She has completed our most rigorous academic program, including nine advanced placement or AP courses, and will graduate in the top 5% of her class. Sophia is the daughter of Lori Martins. Congratulations, mm -hmm. Sophia. Dylan, within our school community, Dylan has been exceptionally active in multiple organizations. I think he's involved in or knows about almost everything that happens at Scarborough High School. <laughs> he advocates for the voice, voice and rights of others with, um, and believes that this is of critical importance. As is seen in his work on the Civil Rights Team, the Gender and Sexuality Alliance, the Student Health Advisory Board, and the Equity Improvement Network. His volunteer service has also included work with the Reduced Sexism and Violence Prevention Program, or RSVP program, and his dedication to the Environmental Club. Dylan is committed to helping others and to affecting positive change in his community. He also started a monthly ga gathering of all club presidents to improve communication amongst the groups, the student groups, and to better organize service projects, fundraising, and school events. He has taken leadership to the next level, serving as a student representative to the Board of Education. Um, outside of school, Dylan has been a long-term volunteer at Fallbrook Woods, served on the Scarborough Public Library Teen Advisory Board, helped establish the Maine Youth Environmental Association, as, and is employed part-time during the school year. In addition to his remarkable service, Dylan has completed a challenging academic program throughout his high school and will graduate in the top 50% of his class. He is the son of Gene Hinton. Congratulations, Dylan. A couple other recognitions. Um, we want to also congratulate our SMMA girls and boys. You might have seen this post on um, Twitter. Uh, Josie Couture, if I'm saying her name properly, Madison Blanche, Julia Freeman, and Nick Fiorello all received honors through SMMA um, by either being on the first, second, or third team, and Nick was also an SMMA all academic, which is a huge accomplishment. So congratulations to those high school students. And that concludes my recognitions for tonight. I mean, there's more, but we'll, we'll stop there. Okay. 7.0, the spotlight recognition. Um, so tonight I am, as the spotlight recognition is always really special, and I, I love doing it, but it's, it's especially special when I know the person who has received it. Um, Kate Anderson is our winner for this month. She's the social worker at Eight Corners. Um, of course, we did a video, which we, um, I focused a, on a specific aspect of what Kate does at, does at Eight Corners, so I wanted to also read the nomination that we got. Um, uh, and it says, Kate Anderson is the school social worker at Eight Corners. While she tirelessly performs the myriad duties involved with this complex job, 
providing support to all the students, family, and staff, Kate also goes above and beyond every year. She has introduced an intensive mindfulness curriculum that has become an integral part of our school, and she has inspired many teachers to follow in her footsteps, including her teachings in their classrooms. Kate also annually presents suicide awareness training to all of the phases in our district. Kate is a building lead at Eight Corners and is often compelled to step in to handle delicate, sometimes stressful situations. This year, Kate implemented a behavior tracking program for the entire school that she learned about at a conference last year called SWIS and is a tool that will enable staff to track behaviors of students during less structured settings. With every initiative that Kate introduces, she continues to create such a positive environment in the Eight Corners community. There are so many facets to how Kate is a shining star in our school. However, the most important one is the way she interacts with the students. Kate does not merely practice her social worker skills in her office. She moves throughout the school, engaging and helping each and every student to gain confidence, to feel supported, and to feel cherished. Um, so, I, do you have that? So with that lovely nomination, we have a little video here. <laughs> Oops, we don't have sound.
Sam, you're a great mindfulness teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you need any tissues. <laughs> so, I'm very excited tonight. For the very first time ever, we have some special guests that we invited to help me present our Spotlight Award. Um, we have some students from Eight Corners who um, volunteered to come tonight and give Mrs. Anderson her award. So Mrs. Anderson, can you come up? And um, students, you can come over here. Superintendent's report. Wait, can we're just oh, going to take it. a quick break in Sorry. case anybody um, needs to go home for bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. We just want to give it a little. Yeah. I'm ready. <laughs> oh, wait, can I? Yeah, I was going to say, board. The whole of my short side of the day is just gone. Busy one. I'll hunt you all down. Ty, we have to run. We have to take a break for now. <laughs> Representatives report. So we've invited uh, some members from the Scarborough High School Key Club to come and kind of chat about what they do. Handing that over again. I'm going to make it easier for you. Thank you. Hi, we're from the Key Club. Um, my name is Cameron Jerry, I'm the president, and I'm Jackie DePatro, I'm the district treasurer. Um, so a little bit about what Key Club is. Uh, it's a really big organization, and we're just a small club, a part of it. Um, but our goal overall is just to perform acts of service in our community that overall make a good impact on everyone around us and hopefully help people who need it. 
Yeah, so we have some examples of what we've been doing this year and what we do every year. Um, so one kind of special thing we started mostly this year is we partner a lot with other clubs in our high school, which is something pretty special. Recently we've worked with the Environmental Club, we've worked with the Buddy System or Natural Helpers, we held a courtyard cleanup day, we held a mental health day during midterms where we had lip coloring and snacks, it was really fun. <laughs> Um, every week on Tuesdays after school we have a meeting and some of those meetings we call activity meetings which are basically just long meetings where we make cards to send to veterans homes or we make uh, little notes to put on students lockers for midterms um, and they're just really fun easy activities that we can do to just brighten someone's day. Another big thing we're working on and we've been working on for the past two years is partnering with the Thirst Project which is an international charity working to end the global water crisis. Um, we have for Thirst done multiple fundraising events as you can see in the photos we had a fundraising booth at Summerfest. We did a project called the Thirsty 30 with our club and we had multiple conference calls. We met the founder of the Thirst Project which is pretty cool and our club is that's one of our club's main goals is to help fundraise to build a well. Um, so like Cameron said, for the month of January, we participate in something called Thirsty 30, which is a fundraising project for the Thirst Project. Um, we just simply put a number in an envelope, and every key clubber who wanted to came up and grabbed one. And that means that they pledged to raise the amount of money inside the envelope, and in a month, we raised $230. So it was really incredible and special, and it totally helped us uh, to raise more money for our goal. Um, another one of our biggest fundraisers is something we've done every year since before we were even around, um, which is called Candygrams, which is during the month of December, right before our holiday break, Sorry. we make little candy canes with notes on them and sell them at lunches, and people can write notes and we deliver them right before we get up for a holiday break. Um, it's actually inspired by Mean Girls, I don't know if any of you know that scene, but um, we donated all the proceeds to Camp Sunshine this year, but we usually donate it to random charities depending on the year. Um, another thing that we do kind of yearly is Salvation Army bell ringing. So for anyone who's interested, we always have a few key clubbers sign up. Just go out, brave the cold, because we know that it gets super chilly here, um, and ring bells to hopefully raise some money for them. Um, and so other than our three to four projects we do per month about, um, Kiko is actually pretty special and a lot of people don't know is it's not just a super small thing like just at our school It's an international organization and within that organization our club is a part of division six and outside of division six We are in the uh, New England, England Bermuda, Bermuda, Bermuda district, district. Mm -hmm. So we're part of a district with clubs all over New England and every year There's the district educational conference in Springfield, Massachusetts for a weekend and we always attend, and it's super, super fun. It's one of our key clubbers' favorite events. We, during that conference, as you can see some of the photos, there's award ceremonies celebrating our work from the year, there's talent shows, we elect the new district board members like Jackie, um, and we get to meet other key clubbers as well as different reps from different charities. There's service fairs, there's presentations Workshop, about ideas for service. Everything. It's really cool, it's a super unique opportunity. Um, and on top of that, we also have something called the International Convention, which we send a few key clubbers from every year. Um, every year it's in a different spot, and it's basically uh, decon, but on a much higher level. So we do the same types of things. We attend workshops, we do service projects, but we also get to tour a really fun city. Uh, last year it was in Chicago. Before that it was in San Antonio. Um, so it's just a really fun way to meet key clubbers from all around the world. I have friends now who are from California or from Arizona just because of this conference, which is super fun to say, um, and it's just a blast, and the key clubbers that we've sent there have always had such a fun time. Yeah, and I can speak to that a little too. I went to San Antonio and also to Atlanta, Georgia through ICON, and along with literally meeting key clubbers from all over the world, which is crazy and such a unique opportunity, you really do get to learn a lot about service, and I got so many ideas and met so many like leaders and founders of international charities and got to personally meet them. I know I was, we were inspired to do a like bone marrow blood drive, and there were all these unique ideas we had for service projects that we got just from going to this, as well as just meeting some really amazing people that were just as motivated to volunteer as us. Um, so that's really all we have for you. I hope after this you kind of understand a little bit more about what we do and what Key Club is as a whole. And if you have any questions, we're here and we'd love to answer them.
for making time to come and share your work with us. I love this um, tradition now of like learning about some of the different things that are going on in the high school. So um, thank you, girls. That was a very nice presentation. So I want to go to San Antonio. <laughs> yeah. So to continue on with our report, I just want to start off our report by sharing some adorable pictures of kindergartners at Eight Corners. Um, they recently celebrated Fairy Tale Day, and all the students were asked and encouraged to dress up as their favorite fairy tale character. So you can see, I'm guessing the one on the right, the right is like a goat or something, the middle one, <laughs> the wizard maybe, I'm not quite sure. Um, <laughs> so Blue Point uh, students celebrated pajamas, a pajama spirit day for Read Across America in honor of Do Dr. Seuss. Um, Read Across America is an organization that encourages students to celebrate the love of reading. Schools will typically hold a Read Across America Day close to Dr. Seuss's birthday, which is March 2nd. But unfortunately this year, March 2nd was a Saturday, so many schools held this day of celebration this week or the past week. Um, Pleasant Hill is also celebrating Read Across America with hopes of reading 5,000 minutes during the month of March, and teachers have reported that 610 minutes have been read so far. And also the picture on the right was at eight corners. Football players from the University of New England who are majoring in education come, came by to help celebrate this day of reading. Um, and they actually read with the children. As you can see, they came dressed up in uniform and spent a really fun day with eight corners. So at Wentworth, the library set up a book tasting for students, as you can see. Um, the librarians decorated the library to make it look like a fancy restaurant, um, and the place card at each table was a different genre of book. Um, so the genres were realistic fiction, historical fiction, fantasy, and mystery. Um, students were encouraged to branch out and choose a genre that they typically, they usually typically didn't read, um, and then they learned about different books in that specific genre. So far, the students have loved this activity. All right, I'm going to try to make this somewhat fast. Um, so on February 9th, students from the Oak Hill Players uh, Theater team had the opportunity to participate, well, actually, that whole week, really. They had the opportunity to participate in a master class with um, some different actors and actresses from Broadway and different shows. One of them was the actor who played Shrek and Shrek Musical that toured like the planet. Um, like, if you've ever been on Netflix and you saw that recording, that's the guy. Like, it was a really big opportunity. Anyway, so they had a series of days they got to go and train with these professionals after school. And I think they actually even devoted a few days on the weekend, which is pretty big for any high schooler. Um, but, uh, and they learned how to partake in different auditions and how, like, really to present your song rather than just sing it. And then at the end, they performed in front of families, friends, and the community. And it was quite inspiring to see. I don't have photos, but also one act just recently happened. Um, the one act play is a student written play each year. I believe it's a tradition we have. And um, they'll be going this weekend to compete. I don't remember which school, but like where? Lawrence. Thank you. Lawrence, there we go. Um, but yeah, that was a really awesome opportunity, and next month, they'll be, Oak, Oak Hill Players will be here to talk about next year's show. Um, Dylan, you have some competition. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, another huge thing, this last weekend we had a couple of different wins. Uh, six students representing Scarborough High School participated in the Regional Science Bowl on March 2nd. This is a nationally sponsored program by the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, they compete in different science and math trivia, and this year they achieved second place. So I just wanted to recognize Riley Bellavo, Jackie DeQuatro, who mm -hmm. seems to be all around here, um, <laughs> Cameron Jury, who is also just here, Selena Liu, Madeline Shields, and Eric Yu. Uh, they did a wonderful job. They Last week beforehand, they were saying that they were hoping to come in ninth. <laughs> so it's quite That's impressive awesome. that they came. 
in second. Um, Dylan, why are they all wearing witches hats? That's a, th I don't, I know they wear something different each year. Oh. Last year they wore like Just Hawaiian themed shirts and this year they did that. <laughs> I support it. I mean, it's a fun thing. <laughs> Another huge thing was the 2019 Scarborough High School Academic Decathlon team who won state championships recently. Um, this past Saturday, uh, I'm sorry if I butcher any of these names. Uh, Harshini Shanganti, Rashika Sai Devarjan, Ryan Ocampo, Connor Benier, um, Anthony Gotti, Brendan McKelvey, Ethan Devise, and Ian Youth, who also got the highest score in the state. Oh. They will be competing in the national competition in Minneapolis next month which is unbelievable. I could never do what they do. Um, another thing that just happened yesterday, the civil rights team hosted a postcard writing event. Uh, they wrote postcards to different local, state, and federal representatives. Uh, about, and we provided the postcards, we provided pizza, we provided all the resources they needed so they could exercise their civic duties. And at the end, staff and students together created over 40 different postcards to send. So you might be receiving some soon. Um, <laughs> I do know that some wrote to the board and the town council. And then this, I believe, yeah, this is my last thing. This is super exciting because I can finally stop talking about it. Um, <laughs> this week is compost week at the high school. It is a thing we've done once a semester, I think, this last two years. But one big thing we're doing this year is that we have finally got silverware at the high school. So af as of Monday, every school and district now has metal silverware. No more plastic. <laughs> That's really exciting. We're looking into different reusable materials for plates and cups and anything else we may be trying to throw right now, along with like single sort recycling. So hopefully we can work on that in the upcoming years. Congratulations, Dylan. Thank you. Thank you. Really hard on that. Awesome. Pass that down. Okay. All right, 9.0, superintendent's report. Yes, two things tonight. Um, it's the first meeting of the month, so I um, want to share our enrollment with you. And as promised at our last meeting, um, Kelly has added for us the newest um, best fit model and this is the one that we agreed we were going to use as our numbers. And so the numbers you see here are the current year 1819 numbers um, for all three studies that we now have. And so we can see sort of how the studies are faring out ac in, in terms of accuracy. Um, and our enrollment is up seven students this month, uh, um, pretty, pretty close to the best fit model number. So it's pretty pretty interesting to dig into that data and we're still going through all of the different types of charts to determine you know are we using the very best chart for this monthly comparison but it's hugely helpful as we're planning for next year and working through the budget cycle so I won't read all the numbers to you but um, here they are again for you this month any questions about enrollment can you, can you just remind me what MFI stands for sure um, multi-family multi Thank you. What's the I? I don't know. Impact. 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 There you go. Yes. Thank you. And then um, our, the second item under my report is really to turn the microphone over to our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Monique Culbertson, who is going to walk you through both our curriculum guide and the program of studies so that you'll be well informed for your action items later on in the agenda tonight. So Monique. Thank you so much. Typically, I have a laptop here where I push a button and move. Thank you so much. <laughs> I knew there was something missing. So thank you so much. Um, first off, I'd like to talk a little bit about what a curriculum is. Sometimes we feel that a curriculum, whoops, wrong way. Sometimes we feel a curriculum is the program of materials that we purchase to support that. It's not. A curriculum is really a course of study. <coughs> it's a roadmap for the teaching and learning. We certainly have materials and resources to help us deliver that curriculum, but um, the program itself is not necessarily the curriculum. So here are a few characteristics of a high quality curriculum. Um, we want to make sure that a high quality curric our curriculum has outcomes, clear outcomes for all students. And that's that part that Marzano talks about, a guaranteed curriculum for all students. 
but also the opportunity to learn rigorous content. And this is that viable piece. It's about time and access to curriculum. It also needs to be flexible to meet the range of interests and needs of our students. But it also needs to evolve to meet the needs of learners in a changing world. And tonight you'll see within the program of studies some new courses being offered. And you'll hear about some courses that are um, also being taken out of the program of studies. It also needs to engage students in some relevant, authentic learning because we are preparing them for their future. Also includes current evidence-based strategies for learning and allows students' knowledge and skills to build across the, the grades. It's not okay to just have a bunch of activities in third grade that don't relate to a bunch of activities in fourth grade. <clears throat> so that needs to build over time. It's also taught, assessed, and adjusted by the teachers. They look at how the students do, they look at the outcomes that their students have, and then they adjust accordingly. So teacher involvement is key in that. But there also needs to be a purpose for a curriculum, and we have clearly delineated within our documents from our mission, we want each and every student to be a resilient, lifelong learner who's prepared to engage as a contributing member of our society. So that is our overall outcome for all of our students. That describes the what. Part of our how we want our curriculum to be implemented is articulated in our values and our collected commitments. So for example, we want to ensure that all students understand what they're learning, why they're learning it, and that they can describe their learning goal and track their progress. That's a step in the direction of becoming an independent learner. So developing a curriculum guide for your consideration, our challenge was really to develop a guide that describes all of our curriculum and all of its complexity. But also, we want to pro provide access to all teachers. We have teachers working with students across the buildings, students in a variety of different programs, and some teachers who may be teaching at the middle school might need the resources and want to know what's happening at 3-5. A fifth grade teacher might need to know what's happening at fourth grade. So providing teachers that access to those resources, materials, and ideas and expectations help teachers do their jobs. We also encourage the collaboration. Um, it also needs to allow for teachers to make improvements as they work together. Um, that is the significant challenge with the old paper-based curriculum guys that sat on the three-ring binder where we used to get the curriculum committee together, and that three-ring binder made a beautiful uh, spot right on the shelf. So it was rarely open. So um, luckily, we are in a digital environment where we can provide more flexibility um, and uh, responsiveness uh, than that old printing press. And a part of this, we want that, that guide to ensure that it's a quality curriculum for all students as well. So what I'm going to be presenting is a web-based guide. Um, it was designed, I want you all to know that it was designed for feedback from teachers. Uh, we were using an application that teachers were not happy with. Um, it was complex, it was unfamiliar to them, and it was not um, responsive enough to their needs. So we are using a common unit design format that's been in place for quite some time. We also, um, in this web-based guide, wanted it to be flexible and accessible to all teachers so teachers could be, participate in the editing. So here is a screenshot of that website. There's a navigation across the top and down the bottom, but it really is designed to make curriculum information accessible to all staff in our collaborative effort to to craft and then deliver quality experiences for all of our students. Uh, standards and learning goals, that's our language that we use to articulate our standards. They're based on our state standards, the system of the learning results. Uh, and then we have our teachers working together to articulate and unpack those standards and articulate those for each grade level and also for courses in high school as well. So taking a look at that, we needed a way in which we could make access, provide access so not everyone needed to be able to edit a website. So we used that Google Doc embedded within the website. So teachers have access to that Google Doc, and they have rights to those links to link their work to this document. This document articulates our standards and our learning goals. Here's a blown up image of that um, navigation page. And so if teachers are interested, if they're a grade three teachers and they're interested in what's going on in K2 and see what the outcomes are for that, they can just click into the grade two piece. 
So on the left-hand side of this screen, what we've done K through five is we have these three columns and we articulate the learning goals and the standards so that you can see across a phase level how the outcomes for our students build upon each other. For the high school, it's a little bit more complex because they're organized in many different courses. So we've set up a spreadsheet within that document so that we can go in and each one of those courses is a link and you can, the teachers can click on that link and go dive right into the document that contains those learning goals. And so we have a central source for those. In terms of the guiding principles, the guiding principles are a component under those system of the learning results. And we've been working at each of those phase level to articulate the difference between the guiding principles and the content standards. We did not want to set up those guiding principles to be another set of standards. That's not how they were articulated. Um, but so what we've done is we've taken the guiding principles. We have teachers working together at each phase level to identify those pieces. They work together. Um, and we're really looking at the end of each phase level for students to be able to articulate the importance of a continuous improvement or growth mindset. So these are skills that even as an adult we're all working on. Um, being a clear and effective communicator, a creative and practical problem solver. It's embedded within the curriculum and within those units that you'll see in just a moment, but we also want students to be able to reflect on their skills, to own those skills, know what their strengths are, what their challenges are, and then to be able to plan forward. So maps, this is the messy part of the curriculum, and this is the part where we bring teachers together, K through 12, to work together to do that vertical articulation. And, it is, and we have a document which contains that. It's sort of our sloppy copy of our conversations across the phase levels. So adding some visuals here across the top, if you look over on the right-hand side, that's a group of teachers, those are K-12 health and PE teachers who came together to literally map out their curriculum. What that means is those pink post-its are the K-2 big ideas, resources, and the sequence of the programming for K-2. The purple was a 3-5, the, I think it is bright green, is the middle school, and the blue was the high school. And so on the board, they actually put those in post-its, they rearrange them, they have conversations within a phase level, and then, as you can see, on the left-hand side, you have a middle school teacher and a high school teacher, health teachers collaborating, asking questions of each other to learn more about what they do so they can better vertically articulate the curriculum and build those ideas. And then we capture that electronically and post that so that teachers can see that. Underneath, we also do curriculum mapping for other reasons. At the K-2, each one of those colors is a different subject area across the grade levels, and we use that to study and identify across the, across the content areas where we might have opportunities for integration. So as a result of this map, the K-2 teachers have built several transdisciplinary units for students, which integrate the content for students around a real-life problem to solve. And the tools, that's an area where if we want teachers to access this guide and be able to make copies of the templates and tools, that's just where we store them across the, on this guide. <clears throat> the units, this is really the heart of the curriculum guide for teachers, and this is the place where we want the collaboration to take place. So the instructional units and calendars, you can look at it as almost like a landing page for a grade level or a course, and then we have a unit guide which articulates the details around a unit. And of course, at the high school is a little different because of their course structures and many different offerings. But you can start to see that a bit at the middle school in the area of mathematics. So here, when you click on, for example, English language arts in kindergarten, here is your, we call it a course calendar, but you have a description, the course name, and the description. This is where the program of studies description would fall right in this course calendar. And then the teachers list their units and approximately when over the course of the year that unit is taught. And then those are links, the teachers can make links to those units. And going into a unit, you have the unit name, the course name, and then you can see who put those together originally, the collaborators. There's a bit of a summary in there, but then we talk about our learning outcomes. 
Um, and I talk to teachers, um, they talk about how much work this is, and I remind them that they all aren't going to be around forever, and we are gonna be bringing new staff into the district, and they need some resources, and they need some guidance in terms of um, what to teach and how to teach. So this set of learning outcomes includes those standards and learning goals. It also has a spot for the guiding principles, and this is where the guiding principles connect. It asks where this unit provides the opportunities for students to learn and practice and show evidence of their growth in these skill areas. It also includes the key ideas, essential questions. These are all organizers for teachers. And the learning targets. These are those I can statements where students can track their learning and own and take responsibility for their own learning. And then of course the vo vocabulary and then the evidence of learning. But here's where um, the learning plan, and this is where the collaboration needs to take place. In this example, there seems to be nothing there. Uh, there's a link there in which our instructional coach, working with classroom teachers, put together a Padlet. And a Padlet is just another electronic medium to share resources. And this is where teachers can go to get all of their resources to help them teach those lessons within those units. And so teachers on this page will be able to add to this. They'll have conversations. They'll make suggestions if there are ideas for differentiating or if there's a connection to other disciplines or other units, they can link, provide links and put that information there. Um, we're only bound by the time we have for teachers to do this. Uh, and they're working very hard. And each um, school has a different timeline for working on the curriculum units. In terms of the high school program of studies, um, it would be connected, those descriptions would be connected from here. This year, I know Jen and Hazel just stepped out, but Jen has been instrumental at redesigning the high school program of studies this year to be in the new Google um, website format, which makes it much more accessible to all. And we're offering this for your consideration as well. The front page in the new program of studies contains course registration, information, expectation level, some general information. Um, also includes, as it always has, the graduation requirements. What's in the program of studies right now is the current policy, the current program of study, uh, excuse me, the current graduation policy. As the board and the teachers work on making changes in that, because it's a web-based piece, not a print um, media, then the new policy will be posted. Um, on the left-hand side is the navigation for the courses and course selections. Um, one of the formats, um, the layout here is quite, I believe, simple and elegant and accessible uh, with all the information, both the course description as well as the sequence of courses for each of the offerings um, at the high school. There are some new courses being offered, and this is a wonderful example of how a current uh, cur uh, curriculum evolves over time. Um, 21st century skills for the young adult is what some refer to as the adulting course, um, where you learn all <laughs> kinds of things about how to be an independent adult. Um, the idea for this course came from an eighth grader at the middle school who sent uh, the superintendent an email, superintendent brought me in, I met with the student and with the uh, middle school principal and then we had conversations at the high school and we're going to throw this new course into the ring. We also have, you'll notice dance to, guitar to, history of film, those are our ability to offer um, courses, more advanced courses for students and a wider array of electives for students. Um, based on their interest. Introduction to computer science and coding. This is part of the work that science and technology has, department has been doing at um, making pathways for our courses in those areas and coordinating the course offerings so that they build upon each other rather than just a, lots of, a, a wide scope of courses to choose from. Uh, music production is another piece where students will have the opportunity to learn about digital music production. And video and auto, audio production basics is an interesting course because it's a dual enrollment course that we're looking to offer in which the students will receive both high school credit and college credit through SMCC. There are courses that are coming out of the guide. I wasn't able to put a slide in there, um, but Sue Ketch can describe, Principal Ketch can describe what that is. Um, so 
the other piece I want to final, you know, culminate with is community access to this. Well, certainly the program of studies, upon approval, will be posted on the school website and be accessible, and students will be registering for courses pretty quickly, um, sometime before the end of March. The concept for the curriculum guide, upon approval of the board, is that each school will continue with their timeline for their work. We're looking at doing, um, getting everything ready for a fall. It, it's available on our internet right now because it's a work in progress, but we're looking at ha doing another relaunch and engaging teachers with that work uh, again this fall. We're gonna use this summer to um, have teachers come together to continue to build those pieces within the guide. Uh, and we're also gonna begin to design a community curriculum guide. Uh, the Scarborough uh, School Board Curriculum Committee has been involved and aware of this site and we'll be collaborating to provide feedback in the development of a site that the community can access. Uh, and we're targeting a date in the fall of 2019 to make that happen so that the community can have access to some of these pieces. Um, and it's that challenge between sort of that dynamic piece that changes over time and what the community um, wants to see in terms of our curriculum. With that, I thank you for uh, your attention on this, and uh, I would like to extend a kudos to uh, Jen Adams, who um, is serving as <laughs> mom tonight, uh, as well as uh, website uh, designer uh, extraordinaire. So thank you, Jen. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Jen, um, Jen, Albert, and Sue, did you want to add anything about the program of studies? If you want to come over to the microphone so folks can hear you. So I just, um, Monique did mention courses that have been cut and some of them are because we've tried things um, we try to talk to kids and see what they think they would be interested in. Then we run the course for a year or two and see if it takes off. And sometimes there just isn't as much interest. So, for example, um, in music, we tried um, something called band storm and storm chorus where it, students could join those to play an instrument, but it wouldn't be a performing group like um, on stage like we do with the normal bands and chorus. And we wanted to see if there might be some interest of, of students who would like to play but maybe not have to perform. And that hasn't really taken off. So as we can see, um, They've added music production, um, the video and production basics, and, and some things like that as well to see if maybe those would take off. The music production is one that we're going to um, kind of do some work with an SEF grant and uh, the Feinberg um, scholarship, that, that grant money, and see if we might be able to um, make sort of a music production studio. So we're gonna kind of try that avenue to fund the equipment to run a course like that. Um, we did cut some English classes um, last year. If you remember, we did um, come back an English teacher. So with less staff to teach in the English department, there are a couple of things we've pulled out so that um, in the English department, we have to start with every student being able to have an English class. So if numbers go up a little bit, we have to make sure we're, we're accommodating that first. So um, English 9 Remediation, Classic Mystery Fiction, My Shakespeare, Your Shakespeare, and Journalism. Um, we've removed um, this year, Bandstorm, Storm Chorus, Storm Chorus 2 have come out. Um, in science, we've um, moved out microbiology, genetics and genomics, electronics and electricity, technology for today, computer apps and business, entrepreneurship and accounting. Some of that work in the technology front is because our teachers, um, John McHugh and Lisa Joyner, are going to be partaking in some new training through code.org, and we got a little bit of funding from the state to send them to that, and we're kind of revamping those courses to more meet the need of what students are saying they'd like to be learning there. So again, we're just trying to be very responsive to what our students um, are um, asking for. So those were the things that were cut this year or were removed from the um, program of studies for this year. It doesn't mean they're gone forever, but for this year that 
that will happen. And I believe um, when Jen sent you the program of studies for this year, um, she also sent you a version where you can see what has been added and what's been deleted, and we thought that might be helpful for you to scan it um, just to see how it's changed. Um, and this is a process we've been working on since um, in January, I think, we started talking about it at ILT and asking people to go through and, and get things um, updated and modified. And then, as we've pointed out, Jen has been doing great work to bring this to a little bit more user-friendly program through the That's Google great. Docs. And um, she has great visions and dreams. She talks to me about adding pictures to it and even um, one dream that might be a year or two away, but we've talked about maybe trying to have some video clips of these classes in action. Cool. So if a student, especially maybe our eighth graders who aren't at the high school yet, and think, I wonder if I would like that, might be able to go on and watch like a minute and a half little clip of the class just to kind of get a flavor of of how the class work. We thought that might that interaction might be interesting for the kids instead of just the you know the little blurbs on every course. So um, that's something Jen has great ideas, and I'm just nodding yes when she says them. <laughs> how do I help? So um, does that kind of did you have any specific questions you no, wanted to answer? No, I didn't answer. If you guys had anything you wanted to add, or maybe you guys have specific questions. I, I have one specific um, logistical question, I guess. But I, I just want I want to thank you, Jen, for giving us that resource. It was super helpful to be able to look at that ahead of time and wrap our head around what, what the program of studies was and what it's going to be this school year. Um, I did, I have a, it's actually a science question. So, uh, and I have a science teacher. <laughs> on the, um, I, I noticed I was when I was looking at the prerequisites. I noticed that um, all of the courses except for AP Bio and Biology four had the course prerequisites, but no gr no grade requirement prerequisite. And so, in Bio, both the AP and the Level four had a specific grade that students had to earn in their prior science class to be able to take that class. So I was just wondering why the differenti differentiation between bio. Let me, uh, let me grab that and look at what you're referring to. I have it pulled up right here if you want to. Do you want me to? Um, so I will say uh, that now you mentioned that, I'm noticing a typo with bio 3. It shouldn't be 9 through 12. I'm pretty sure it should be 10 through 12. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, as far as AP environmental science, we do open that up to freshmen. Um, it's a high level, uh, it's a high level course. So there's requirements you have to be recommended from your eighth grade teacher in order to get involved with that. But we've had great success in growing that as kind of an introductory course mm -hmm. to a AP curriculum. Um, what were the other courses you were I, referring? I'm from? just, I'm just ask, I'm just really asking about the AP Biology and the Biology Four. They have like, they'll say like prerequisite of 90 or better in Environmental Science Four or a 95 or better in Environmental Science Three. Mm -hmm. But that science is the only science that has an additional prerequisite yep. of a specific grade. So I was just wondering so, what the rationale was. So those prerequisites over the years have been fine tuned. Um, to try and uh, to try and meet the needs of both the teachers and the students, we found that over time, you know, there's different interests in different courses, and sometimes we can, um, you know, we'll have lots of kids interested in a certain course to the point where we can't provide um, the staffing to support that interest. So over time, we've had to modify and adjust. I think uh, anatomy and physiology is a great example of that's a really really attractive course, um, and kids love to take in. We've had to adjust the prerequisites um, so that we're making sure that we are getting an appropriate number of students of kids that are absolutely dedicated to doing it and are ready to tackle that course. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are times where kids, we, we want to welcome kids to take any course that um, they would love to, you know, any course that they desire. Um, but at the same time, we can also do a little bit of a disservice if we, if we bring a kid into a course that might be a little bit um, too challenging, and, and we need to make sure that we fine tune those so that they are stepping, uh, taking the proper steps in order to get to that. So I would say that AP Biology is a great example of something where kids are coming from freshmen, uh, you know, jumping into high school, um, and you know, a lot of kids uh, may have been 
um, wanting to challenge themselves by stepping up in the bio, and we've uh, accommodated that, and then we've had to kind of fine tune that. So I, I would say that uh, um, those haven't changed since last year as far as the AP bio requirements, I don't believe. Um, but we have had to fine tune that, and there's been a little bit of a science to try and figure out exactly what that matches. And I do anticipate, you know, over time, that those continuing to change slightly, um, just to make sure that we are uh, um, uh, trying to encourage kids to challenge themselves, but at the same time, trying to make sure that they're getting into a, a level that's appropriate for them so that they can grow uh, and, and uh, be successful later on. A, I have a question, um, and I don't know if this is like I'm. I'm thinking of like course of studies in college. Are, do you have um, limitations to how many students can can um, join certain classes, and if so, is it indicated in any way for the students? So the schedule is know, built by. You know, um, Remind me, I want to go back and talk about the best matches for kids. Okay. But to answer your question, students sign up and register for what they would like, and we start building what we're going to teach by those numbers. Okay. And of course, sometimes, if, if maybe we're growing a course, we're offering it for the first time, so maybe if we get 12 or 14 students to sign up for it, we say, we're going to try to run that if we've got the staff to do it, because we want to give it a little room to grow. And, Maybe if those taste, kids take it and really love it, they'll get the word out and the next year we'll have more. That's not always the case. Sometimes it, if, like for example, we're offering dance two this year and we may have enough to offer one dance one and one dance two. If we had enough requests to have two dance ones and one dance two, which is the new class, we would try to do that. Okay. But we try to make that match. And then sometimes looking at the overall schedule for that department, and we have a limited number of teachers who can teach so many sections each, and then sometimes we have to kind of look at that and try to best meet what kids would like to take. So we kind of build our um, schedule as much as we can off what the students want to take. The one thing I was just going to say about making that good match, for example, on Monday, a team um, from the high school went to the middle school. Um, we spent about um, 35 minutes with the eighth graders to say hello to them, and to, we took some students with us who gave them um, some confidence building ideas and answered a few questions and things. And then our some a core group of our freshman teachers met for about 45 minutes with the eighth grade teachers to kind of talk, answer questions. One of our biggest goals is to have the very best match for students in the course. Challenging enough, not too overwhelming, um, that we move, we move them along and we challenge them a little bit. Um, so those teacher recommendations and conversations and like, like um, we were talking about with, if we know a certain grade is going to really indicate success, we will do that in the program of studies. Um, we also have the option, families have the option of doing an override sheet. So if, let's just say for example, we've, we've recommended a student for a math class at level three, but that student would really like to try an honors level class. They have um, the option of turning in a sheet that kind of talks about what supports they might put in place and why they might like to try to step up. And so that is part of our process as well. We try to give students our very best information and thinking on how they can be successful, but sometimes families know something we don't know, that that's really a passion, or maybe they've been getting some extra help and really want to try to, to grow that, and if they've got good rationale and we think we're, we're willing to give them a shot at that success, we have that in our process as well. So I just wanted you to know that we do really try to listen to families and kids and, and help them get where they want to go. I, so um, with your technology and engineering offerings, mm -hmm. uh, who, what department's responsible for teaching that? So um, through the state of Maine, that the DOE, they call it science and technology, and we've had those teachers kind of looped in with the science department. One of the things um, 
you'll hear a little bit of in, about in budget requests is that we're looking um, and hoping for a teacher that maybe could focus on that. Right now, we've been really lucky that between Lisa and John and then different science teachers have stepped up to, to take on a different STEM um, or engineering piece. Um, so that's primarily how they've been covered is through science teachers and the two technology teachers. So that's the reason why I was asking. I, I, and I wanted to know if you're feeling that impact in the mm -hmm. science department, if you could describe sort of so what that's what, like. What we are, and jump in, but what we are feeling is that as those teachers have stopped teaching like a biology four, in order to teach a STEM class or a chemistry class in order to teach a STEM. We are seeing in some of our course offerings a little bit tighter um, fit with numbers. If we've Microsoft. dropped a, a chem class, we might be having a hard time um, getting enough kids, um, not having too many students in the rest of the chem classes. So that is one of the reasons we're kind of asking for that because our hope would be if we found somebody really focused on STEM and engineering, that those teachers maybe could go back to filling a physics class or a chemistry class, and um, that would help with our numbers a little bit in that arena. So that's kind of the basis of that request this year. Thank you. Did you want to add something? Yeah. Um, and when uh, Sue was going through some of the courses that um, are no longer being offered, I, I heard a lot, like, you know, we have uh, a lot of business courses like accounting and entrepreneurship. And a lot of that has actually been because over the last five years, the enrollment in all of our STEM and business courses has grown dramatically. And over those last five years, we've tried a lot of different courses and found, I mean, a lot, I think a lot of the growth has been because you've offered so much. One of the challenges, though, is that we have limited STEM teachers, so they're being stretched mm -hmm. thin teaching so many different yeah. courses. So a lot of that is more um, uh, consolidation and simplification and right now we're in the process of revamping our STEM curriculum so that it's cleaner and more organized and um, Sue and Monique were talking about those pathways. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited about the opportunity but we have been using science teachers to show the demand for engineering courses and so that's where um, as Sue was mentioning we're finding that our science courses are strained class size and there's a lot of areas that we'd like to solve, but we can't because we have some science teachers that are, are we're trying to, we don't want to lose the momentum of the STEM growth that's happening. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I don't, it, this might be a question for Mr. Lee or so. So the, um, uh, the finance committee got a, a preview earlier this week, um, uh, some of the revest, investment proposals, and some of them were specifically related to courses, so dance to STEM, so I guess my question is, the budget will be approved, hopefully, uh, long after students are registering for classes. So in the case where students register for Dance 2, and for whatever reason that doesn't pass, how do we manage that? So right now we have a dance teacher that teaches two sections. She teaches one course in the first semester and one in the second. So we kind of will have some options there. If we have enough students sign up for two classes and there's a good interest for dance two, instead of offering two dance one classes, we may offer one of each. If, if we have great sign up and we, have, we could fill three classes, two dance ones and a dance two, and that's in the budget, then we would be able to grow that program a little bit. But, you know, we'll have to, eventually it will come down to what the numbers requested. Yeah. We may not have a budget need if the numbers don't come in showing that, but if we do and there is budget money there for it, then we might be able to grow that program a little bit. That's a class that's gonna have a little flexibility because we already have her teaching two classes and we're hoping to go for a third, but we'll see what the numbers drive there and then we'll act accordingly. Mm -hmm. So potentially, if we don't have a lot of signups for dance two, then that investment proposal could potentially become lower priority. Correct. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. I think it, you're pointing out 
our challenge every year is the timing doesn't line up. Yes. Students are registering for courses. We don't yet know what's going to be in the budget or not. Yeah. We're doing curriculum planning. We have a vision, but we don't know if we're going to be able to fulfill that yet or not. And so we always are adjusting and adapting based on the outcome of the budget cycle. And that request for dance is really another student-driven request. They've had this dance teacher. Um, they've really loved the dance one, and they have gone to guidance and said, can we get, can we get her to do a dance too so we could keep um, taking that course? So that's, that really is a student request that drove that budget request this year. Okay. Thank you. The best kind of request. Okay. <laughs> Jen, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I have a question that's not related to that, but I do want to say that um, I think it's really easy to navigate, yeah. and um, I love the way it looks and is set up. Um, I think I mean I think it looks good and it's easy to navigate. So I mean I think you've done a really really nice job with that. That's great. Um, I also want to say that just like in general, looking through like the course descriptions and the way you've laid out like expectations mm -hmm. and what materials kids might need and even sometimes I notice like it'll say what you should expect for like homework hours and that kind of thing like that information I think is so detailed and you guys have gone above and beyond um, to make this as as um, informational as you can for the students um, to make to, to get that best fit like you were talking about Sue so mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that before I ask my question now to my question. Um, <laughs> so I had a question, Julie, are you still navigating on that? Um, on the in mm, on the introduction? So um, at, if you keep going down, you talk about the graduation requirements. So and as I understand what um, Monique was saying, and this kind of um, I think is gonna answer my question. These are the requirements based on what our policy currently says. Um, so that's the wh why, the why of how you have that, and that policy is under or is going to be um, reviewed in the policy committee. Um, once this is approved, if that policy changes from what we currently have, will this document be changed, or is it like once it's approved, it's approved? And, and it's true with any. Um we also have parent handbooks, and there are rec policies required to be in parent handbooks. And as policies are updated, we are we are under an obligation to update those documents okay. in which those policies are there, from the website to a program of studies. So okay. your approval of the program of studies tonight is with the understanding that as our policies change, that those will change as well. Okay. Thank you. I did. I did have um, at every student graduates meeting today, um, there was a suggestion that maybe we put a little something on the top of this that this program of studies meets the current policy and that as policies change, this would be updated accordingly. And then people, we thought maybe that would clarify that a little bit yeah, for parents great. reading it. So and. Um, and since this is such a live document now, I mean, it used to be you printed the program of studies and that was it for that year, that, um, that, you, that we might be able to put something like that just to help families understand that things can and do change. Yeah, and I think that, that so something we were talking about in curriculum, which, so now our curriculum, um, update is basically done thank you very much like we've done it all but um one of the things we were talking about at our, our last meeting was trying to address some of that confusion in the community and even with some staff about like you know why does this look like this if we're not doing the proficiency-based diploma anymore so i think that actually that idea that you had just said is something that i would be really comfortable with you know putting that in there like as you know this as written meets our current requirements which you know our a current policy, under yeah, policy. Is what we'd want to say. Current right? policy, which is under Amy. <laughs> and is it is it okay for me to do part of our policy Absolutely. report now because it's yes. related? Um, we um, Alicia and I um, were able to um, go to the high school yesterday and, and talk with Monique and Principal Ketch and 
three members of the ILT team, and um, we got really great clarification about the direction that the high school wants to take in terms of graduation requirements. So we had some of these conversations yesterday, and um, we kind of started to map out a timeline that policy committee could use to make sure that we have our um, graduation requirement policy updated and um, that is going to begin soon in policy. And it's, a very, cl it's very clear we're going to get confirmation on March 13th, I think, Sue, you said that ILT meeting is going to happen. We're going to get, we're going to get confirmation um, um, finally, uh, like to final confirmation, excuse me, um, right after that um, day um, to make sure that all of the, the departments at the high school are on board with what um, the teachers yesterday told us was pretty strong consensus that they supported a credit-based diploma. So now we need to do that work and update that policy, and um, we were hoping to be able to start that at our next policy meeting, which is next week, and then um, after the decision is made um, at the high school, bring members of that committee and um, Principal Ketch um, guidance representation to our policy meeting, maybe even have it at the high school um, because if there's um, enough people there, have it, have it over at the high school and start having the conversation about what we think Scarborough should have for a graduation policy. So our goal is to get that done um, in time for those handbooks that are printed to, to, ha to have the new graduation policy in place. If I could just add um, something, we haven't had a chance to talk about that meeting or the meeting that happened today with the Every Student Graduates Committee, which is comprised of teachers and leaders um, and board members. Sarah uh, represents the board on that committee. We also reviewed um, the graduation policy, IKF, through the lens of um, how, do we, how do we ensure that we're serving all students. And so they had some really great suggestions for us to consider for some of our um, and I, I think that it'll be really important to make sure that we're hearing all voices in that policy development. That's process. great. <clears throat> Can I awesome. follow up on, on your report, Amy? Sure. Um, so one of the Thank portions you, of our conversation yesterday was regarding the guiding principles and what that, and, and so just to back up, I guess, with the proficiency-based diploma, the guiding principles were um, considered it as part of that, and um, they're not required if if we move to the credit-based diploma. And so that's not actually accurate. So the guiding principles are part of the main learning results, and when you look at the statute, it still articulates the need for us to ensure that students are demonstrating achievement toward those guiding principles. The nuance in the credit-based, if you're looking at this side-by-side -side document. Yeah is it talks about the certification of um, proficiency in the guiding principles. So that's more of like a grading and reporting piece. But we still, under statute, unless that changes, um, are required to ensure that all students are, are showing, demonstrating achievement. It used to say demonstrating proficiency. That word is strict, struck and through, struck through, struck through. And it now says um, demonstrate achievement. In the guiding principles, okay. so that Thank is still part of it. Yeah, so and, and we talked about that yesterday, and and um, and we heard very clearly that um, the guiding principles are important. You know, I mean, right. every, I mean, no one would disagree that um, ha having our students graduate, being able to um, demonstrate those those skills are that, that's good stuff, um, but it doesn't need to be outside of the coursework. So it was very right. strong. Um, there was strong consensus that um, the teachers would rather do that within their coursework and within, within their curriculum and their classes and within their content. And perhaps that might be the vehicle that they use to demonstrate that students are achieving those guiding principles within their classwork. So, so Julie, could you bring up the curriculum guide um, and the the part where it references the, the guiding principles that Monique had. Are you able to pull, pull that up? Thank you. So, oh, the curriculum guide. Guide. so that was a, a, a big part of our discussion yesterday and sort of where, the, where that work is going to take place. And, and with this portion of the curriculum guide, is, is that 
sort of what the teachers were advocating for, I'm wondering? Is this consistent with, mm -hmm. with their hopes? What is on that guy there is from um, teachers' work. Okay. Um, that came from their work. I think the issue that we need to separate is whether it's a graduation requirement. Right. Um, it, there's no doubt we must instruct and we must assess and achievement. And as I described, it really, uh, you know, the teachers feel that, it, as you stated, Amy, the teachers feel that you met with, the uh, three teachers that you met yet with yesterday, stated that it is important. Mm -hmm. um, and there has been, um, the other piece that I heard yesterday was that there has been good work done in this area. So it's really about what do the teachers want to do now at the high school and K-12 in terms of how to move forward with the learning results. Okay. So when, when Monique, when it talks about the, um, um, under the guiding principles section at the end, it talks about, um, the students will have to gather a body of evidence from their content area work that illustrates their growth and that there needs to be some sort of exhibition, presentation, et cetera, at each phase level. What does that look like in practice? That's the piece that the group of teachers was developing. They were in the process of developing. Uh, and so that may shift, that may change. Um, I have not had the opportunity to bring that group together for a full day because of substitutes, time out of class, and those sorts of things. So I'm hoping this summer to bring the group, be able to bring the group together again and reassess what that means. Um, as I described about the guiding principles, we don't want them to be another set of standards because they're skills. Okay. And so how do we assess growth in that area? Mm -hmm. um, and so some sort of demonstration piece, um, when Amy talked about um, the guiding principles being part of the coursework, absolutely it is, it can't be otherwise. Um, part of the coursework, although some of our teachers would like to include student evidence from experiences outside of class. Um, but as they build either a portfolio or a video documentary of their lives, it becomes a form of evidence of their growth in these areas that they can use for their post-secondary activities or planning or college applications or any of those sorts of pieces. Mm -hmm. So it could, the intent was to serve a real life function to be part of that resume versus transcript notion for graduates. But again, um, given the potential changes coming down the pike, we've got to get those teachers together to decide where they want to go from here with the guiding principles. And the other thing I would point out is if this is the, the unit that Monique shared earlier in her presentation, you see here that the guiding principles are embedded directly into the unit of study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That, that has been the, in, the intent all along. So if we vote on this, this um, curriculum guide tonight and it includes sort of this work in progress, does that somehow limit that work that they want to do with, with sort of hearing their feedback? Tonight know. you're really voting on it in concept that okay. it, there's a ton of work that's going to happen and it's gonna all be teacher driven and really um, think about it as a living, breathing document. Like Monique made that comparison to the, you know, the past where it used to get printed and it was like once a year we pulled out the old pages and put in the new. Now it's constantly evolving as teachers have time on Late Start Wednesdays or during teacher design time or their curriculum meetings, um, department meetings at the high school, they're, they're always working on improving their curriculum. It's never going to be finished. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? All right. Moving on to 10.0, new business. 10.2. Can I have? Oh. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to make a recommendation. But. Um, the recommendation is to approve the Scarborough Public Schools curriculum guide conceptually as you've learned about it this evening. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I think we just had all this. I was <laughs> <not> <laughs> just making sure. I just, I just want to say one last time I'm so excited about, about that guide. I think it's going to be great and when when you, we figure out like you know what level of access do we give the community next year I just it's just going to be such a valuable re resource for everybody involved so good job say thank you it, that yeah, was huge amount of work. a yeoman's amount of work um, thank you all the way across the board for everybody who's been involved in this um, 
it that really moves us forward. Monique's worked very hard mm -hmm. on it to get yeah. it organized and he's got a concept and so forth like and that. I, I think we've been lucky on the curriculum committee because we've really gotten to like dive into it and yeah. see all of the, you know, you got the screenshots, which were fun and <laughs> exciting, but not as fun and exciting as it is when you get to click on all those links and really see um, how everything is connected. <laughs> Well, I, th I think that's exemplified in our first meeting because I can say that going in, since, I mean, right now as a community member before, I, I had never seen it. And so when Monique started going through it with us in the curriculum committee, I sat there being like, well, God, what are we going to do? I mean, there's plenty of work to do, but I was blown away with the amount of work that's there and, and the amount of the ability to drill down, how accessible, how malleable it's going to be. It, it's, it's really an impressive format. And because it's budget season, I will add um, that previously that tool that Monique was talking about that we were using that is very complex, it's, it's super um, dynamic, but it takes a ton of professional development to use it to its potential. Um, so about a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, we decided to move away from that platform and, and put it on Google, because that's where our teachers live. They're on there every day, but it had to be built from the ground up. Um, where in this other platform, um, not only was it costing the district about $15,000 a year just to subscribe to it, um, it, it was a ton of work to get the information in there, but then it was another login teachers had to go to to get to it. And so um, for Monique, this was a big project <laughs> that, that she worked on to get the structure there so that multiple collaborators could be contributing, which is an uneasy thing when you put a lot of time into building something, but um, she really has embraced the messiness of that type of collaboration, but also I think the, the access piece. I'm really excited for it to be rolled out to staff, too. Mm -hmm. So, great. All right, are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Do you want to make a motion for 10 30? Yes. Just put up a visual here for us. Um, so the recommendation is to approve the Scarborough High School 2019-2020 program of studies with the understanding that this too will be is iterative and will be updated certainly as policies are updated, um, but also as we learn more about course offerings and student interests. So moved. Second. Any further discussion on this? Okay. Ready to vote? All those in favor? Okay. Unanimous. <laughs> All right. Perfect. 11.0, chair report. Um, I'm just going to give two really quick updates. One, there is a bullet for um, the superintendent search interview committee. We kicked off tonight. It was a very large room of people. Um, got a lot done. It was really productive. Um, and in an effort to be more communicative in advance, the next workshop meeting is going to be next Thursday, March 21st from 5 to 7. This is a closed meeting. It will be an um, executive session because of the sensitivity of the items that we're covering, um, including the questions that are going to be asked of the candidates. So it will be on the books, but it's closed to the public. Um, and then just as an update, I got all emotional last week talking about Addison. And just wanted to let you know, he placed fourth in New England's, which is a gigantic accomplishment for a student. Um, the highest that anyone's ranked for Scarborough. Um, so huge kudos to him. Including his coach? Including his coach. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Awkward <laughs> yeah. mobility. Yes, it was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all that I have. Moving into committee reports. Um, so for communications, we um, have been working a little bit on um, a timeline of um, information that can go out to the community, um, everything from social media to print media to um, talking in person to people. So that's something that uh, we have a draft of and it's, um, a, again, a living document that we will add to. and change as needed. Um, we're working with the Finance Committee also to get some of the um, sound bites if, or information out that um, uh, uh, in terms of what we're looking to present to the public. We're also talking about the possibility of having um, a hashtag or theme for this year's budget that can be um, on every post um, just to tie it all together. 
Um, there will be a district newsletter. The goal for that is to come out at the end of March. We're talking about what's going to go in that um, now. And then um, we. I also did, uh, so, so there's a district communications committee, which um, is separate from the board's communication committee. Um, uh, but I um, am the liaison for the board to the district communications committee. So I just did an update on um, how that's being rolled out for our communication committee, um, especially considering the fact that we've integrated our communications on social media. Um, so the way it works right now is, just for everyone on the board to know, is um, if you, so the, the board and the district are fully integrated. Our um, school board Facebook page is no longer active. Um, we have the ability to post on Instagram, which then does an automatic post to Twitter, which then does an automatic post to Facebook. Um, so the way it works now is if basically we post something on Instagram, it gets to all three of those, um, all three of those venues. And the website because Twitter's embedded in our. Oh yeah, location. right. And the website. Um, so our, uh, so I just put um, as a reminder that um, our Facebook. <laughs> page is Scarborough Public Schools, which is slightly different from our Twitter handle, <laughs> what do you call it, handle, yeah. whatever, which is at Scar Scarb ME Schools, which is slightly different than our Instagram, which is Scarborough ME Schools. Um, and then of course, at the bottom, you can always go to our website and find a, lo um, a lot of the information um, that you can find on social media. The fun thing about social media is like a lot of the instructional coaches are posting too, so you get some really um, nice pictures and a little bit of a peek inside what's going on in the classrooms um, oh, I really around like the district. that piece on our website. Yeah. 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 Two. yeah. Nice. Um, so the website, and our next meeting is March 13th from 2.15 to 3.15 at Central Office. Hillary, did you want to do a plug for the Joint Town Council School Board? Yes, I forgot to put that on there. Um, so I should have had another little bullet point there that um, the communications committee has also been, um, we've done two now joint communications meetings with the town council communications committee. Um, and uh, we just had one, was it yesterday? Yesterday. Yesterday, so our second one was yesterday. We're going to um, start a, a, a community roundtable event, um, which will have members from the school board and the town council. It will um, not be agenda driven, it will be community driven, so um, it's open to anyone. You can come um, with questions or discussion items, or you can come to listen. Um, and those are, the first one is um, March 26th yes. at here at 6.30 to 8. Um, and we do have um, a flyer and there was a press release, which will give you all the other dates that I forgot to put on here. Awesome. Uh, it's quarterly. And the more the merrier. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if there are other board members that would like oh, to attend, absolutely. by all means, yeah. um, Thanks we would love to have you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ruby. All right, so I apologize for the density of this slide. I know there's a lot here, um, and I'll move through it as expeditiously as possible. So um, three things I wanted to update the room on, and of course, either of my uh, committee mates that want to add anything are welcome to. Uh, first, I did have a, a meeting with um, SEDCO, namely Karen Martin, to talk more about how um, the newest development, the newest um, kind of expansion in Scarborough, also known as the Downs, fits into the work that Rebecca did and presented to us not that long ago. And the good news is, the short version is, Rebecca's work is very robust. We know that there are six different um, uh, models that she presented to us, and, and Julie was talking earlier about the, the avenue that we chose to go, which was best fit, plus the high multifamily impact factor. Um, and um, what's good about this is it seems like the downs, as I said a moment ago, is, is mostly going to fit into that model. The forecast that SEDCO has, uh, we're able to flesh out a little bit more. There's still work to do there. It's still, um, as Karen admitted, the, the town council is coming at this from a very different perspective than the school board is. The town council is coming at it from the idea of finance, and we're coming at it from the idea of how many kids are going to be in our schools. 
Um, so in between there, I think we can actually flesh out a little more uh, to the uh, ability that any of us can predict the future. Um, there may be some peak years, I wanted to put that up there, that Karen talked about, namely four years into the plan, eight years into the plan, there's some, some boosts in the build and things that have come online, so that's something we need to think about. Um, but for the most part, it seems like my initial, and I'll be really transparent, my initial fear was that Rebecca's amazing work was done in isolation of this idea of this new development, and oh my goodness, we're going to have this whole population of students that we weren't expecting. And, and luckily, it seems like that's not really the case. Um, so that's exciting to, to share with the group, and I shared this with the committee the last time we met, which was on the 25th at Scarborough Middle School. Um, we've been uh, keeping up our tradition of trying to meet on site at our schools so that we can see in person some of the challenges that our facilities face. Uh, the middle school has risen, quite frankly, to the top of our list um, with, with challenges. Uh, the middle schools was built for a capacity of 600 when it came online in 1996, right, Joanne? Right. Um, there are now 675 students in there. I think it, it's 775, right? Just well, you know, we did update the enrollment yeah. today. Let's take a look, isn't it? I, I do think it's... I thought it was 675. Here, it's on my slide. No, Six, it's 670. 677. Um, so it's been as high as 807, and this is from Todd's presentation uh, back in 2014-15, um, where there are two separate sets of what we're now calling trailers uh, that students were, were uh, housed in. They always wear trailers. They always wear trailers, but we've changed our terminology. <laughs> Um, and so uh, right now all of our sixth grade um, is, is housed in those trailers and there's another set of trailers that are now uh, deemed by facilities not suitable for students. I believe it's come a, a large storage area. Um, but certainly those trailers are not a permanent solution at the middle school and so that's really risen to the top of a list of things we need to think about. Which leads to my last bullet which is what's next and, and really what came out of Todd's State of the State address and I'll reiterate it here is the important to, to importance of building and putting together some building committees, or maybe one committee, but that will start looking at some of the situations at these facilities and actually start fleshing out what are, what are really our, our options. And in my opinion, the goal comes down to this, eliminating trailers and students going outside for class. When I think of the middle school, those are the two big things that Todd um, kept bringing up. Um, and so how do we move forward? The primary schools, it's the second part of this building committee. Um, you know, uh, there are current site limitations and operational inefficiencies that we're dealing with, um, but there's also the community's affection for our neighborhood schools and that can't be ignored. And so um, one thing is clear, doing nothing isn't an option in the long term with our primary schools. And so the sooner we can start these conversations in a really concentrated group that's outside of overall long-range facilities planning, um, the better off we'll be. And so. Um, that's kind of where things sit from long-range planning. Would either of you like to add anything, Sarah, April? If I could just remind the community that we also do have some immediate short-term needs at yes. our Eight Corners Primary School um, that we'll be talking about throughout the budget process. Yep. And there's some updating to do with the, although you're long-range, there's some short-range needs that we yes. need to discuss at our next meeting. And it does involve more trailers. It does involve more trailers. <laughs> so it's counter to the ultimate vision, but yes. it will serve the immediate needs. What's the can I, uh, what's the process for, for starting that committee? So that's an excellent question. So um, I've actually reached out to Todd to ask him how the Wentworth Committee came about. Okay. And um, that's at our next meeting, I'm actually planning on dedicating the agenda to this mm -hmm. very topic and starting off with a discussion from Todd and most likely Joanne. I was going to ask you about this, but I guess you're finding out now. Um, <laughs> she knows. <laughs> <laughs> then we're going to try and get some history around the, how the Wentworth Committee came together and try and mirror um, both the membership and the process for how that came about. Joanne was really instrumental in both the middle school, the old middle school, and the Wentworth yeah. um, project. So yes. she's a, a key asset I to those conversations. I was on the firing line when the Wentworth project kind of got started. And she's so excited to do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Did you help out with the high school as well? Uh, no. no. That's why it's not air conditioned. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. The middle school was air conditioned, and we went to Wentworth, and I said, will not build a school unless it's air conditioned. It gave us 20 more days of learning for our kids. But the high school didn't listen to me. <laughs> they regret it now. Not they, the they high school, it. but those on the committee. 
I'll support if they want to put air conditioning in the high school. <laughs> <laughs> Curriculum. So oh, that's me again. Um, so, I mean, Monique did most of my work because she, most of what we've been doing um, is doing that kind of dive into the curriculum guide, which um, has been, I think, well, I don't know. I mean, so our curriculum committee is three people who have been in education, and um, so it's pretty exciting for all of us, I would say. We're all, <laughs> um, so, uh, but we were lucky to be able to do that um, and to get this kind of sneak peek at um, the document, even though I understand that it's, it's a work in progress and it's not ready to be put out there into the world yet. Um, we also talked about um, how to increase the community awareness of our curriculum, um, and that's um, part of what Monique was saying earlier, which is that this will be rolled out to staff, and then there will be a, um, a version of it also rolled out as a parent portal. Um, I don't think they'll get into the weeds as much in terms of like um, lesson plans and things like that, but. Um, it will be a tool for them to be able to see, to, to, just to get a better understanding of what their kids are doing or what, or what any kids are doing. Um, uh, one of the other topics was, which we talked about again, <laughs> I feel like I'm just repeating everything, um, to what work we can do to, to decrease the confusion about um, the proficiency-based diploma and that law has changed and how um, we in Scarborough are going to um, continue. Um, obviously, and, and the grading, especially at the high school, the middle school has kind of done, done a lot of that work. Um, so we talked about a possible committee that might define like a, you know, like a portrait of a graduate, um, which would include teachers, maybe, I, I, this is just very conceptual, teachers, parents, board members, et cetera, students, um, students. and it sounds like um, that is some crossover work that might be done with the policy committee, um, since you guys are going to be looking at IKF, which is our graduation policy. Um, we also talked about having the curriculum committee schedule some walkabouts or learning walks um, throughout some of the schools to just um, get a deeper understanding of how that document looks when it's being in use. Um, and our next meeting is March 11th. Does anyone have? All right, so for policy, um, changed the way that it was laid out again. Um, where we are with a few things, in legal review, um, that means that the policy committee has done its work and we have passed it over to ensure that it fits within the models with Drummond. Um, the allergy and sensitivities policy is over there. It's being reviewed with a goal of having a first reading in April. Um, in flight, we are working the agenda planning um, policy and format, again with a goal of presenting for legal review in early April. So we'll finish that work at our next meeting. And we're initializing two of them, um, the disciplinary removal of students with disability review. That had not been looked at for almost 10 years, I think a little over 10 years. So we started that, we have the newest language, it's been redlined, so we'll cover that. As well as starting the graduation requirements, IKF, that we have talked about quite a bit tonight. Um, we'll initialize that and have an invitation that will go out to you know, staff, um, teachers, potentially bring in some curriculum folk as well if we need to, um, just to make sure that we're covered across the board. And I don't know if Amy or Alicia, there's anything you guys want to add? Um, just the, with the disciplinary policy, I think Allison said that the most recent update was 2018. So like we're like, I, is that right, Julie? That mm -hmm. like I think that's the most recent policy that we got in draft form yet last week. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was a, a very recent um, updated policy. So we just want to make sure that um, you know what's new and what we have, and we just want to make sure it's up up to date language. And Alice Allison's doing a review for us. She's comparing the new policy with with the policy that's currently on the books. Yeah. Thank you. All right, and our next meeting is Monday, March 11th. Oh, yes, it's a busy day. Um, so we'll be following right behind um, curriculum at 5 p.m. at Central Office as well. Uh, cool, so since our last meeting, uh, we've had two joint finance uh, committee meetings with town council, um, and they've been successful, I guess, 
depending on how you rate success. Um, but ultimately, we, we came to a collaborative uh, agreement that um, our tax rate, again, will, our goal will, not, will be to not increase the tax rate um, more than 3%. Um, one of the things that we talked about in the committee uh, in the Finance Committee, which then translate, transferred over to the Communications Committee, is sort of how we talk about it in town and trying to clear up some of the, the misconceptions um, or uh, sort of myths. One of the big ones being that that 3% is a tax increase, a tax rate increase, and is not expenditures. So in order to get to the tax, and Julie and mm -hmm. April and Melissa, you guys will correct me, but to get to that 3% tax rate, it's a combination of expendi expenditure increase with the net. school, net, net, net expenditure increase. increase with the school, plus the town, divided by valuation. And that gets us to our mill rate. Now what that looks like generally in the past is the net expenditure increase on the school side will be around five to six percent. So that's the number when we talk, when we, when we go into the first readings and when we see the numbers from basically now to first reading and you see 6%, it's ex net expenditures and not the tax rate increase, which I think is, is one of the important mm -hmm. um, items that we want to clarify. Yes. That has been confused in the past and that number has been what has been put on signs before that has confused the yep. community. So we're trying to get out in front of that and message it better. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, I did just want to call out that, um, as we've all talked about with long-range planning and sort of enrollment, we are seeing in uh, a growth, and so there will likely be a lot of the priority investments that we talk about, including in the budget. Um, some of them are going to be in direct response to that growth and how we support that now, but also how we start to plan for future growth because it's only going up. Any questions or anything to add, you guys? No. No. Um, and then just, just some important dates. So um, you guys will, the rest of the board will get the first look at the budget on April 2nd. You have all those dates in your calendar for, for the meeting with the Leadership Council on the 2nd and the 3rd. Um, and then the first <coughs> reading of the budget proposal will be at our meeting on April 4th. Really, just on there for for people to have them, um, but most of them should be in your calendars, anyways. Cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A lot of dates. All right, that's the end. Nice. Um, that brings us to thirteen point zero. Is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. <laughs> Second. All right, I'm going to go with that. Nine p.m. We're going. We've been in meetings since four o'clock. Yeah. Since all two o'clock. All those work. Work. All <laughs> those <laughs> favor. Okay, you win. Oh, sorry. It's unanimous. Yeah, it's unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> so Good night, everyone. Right.